Guys, Kevin Mitch here on the Big Head Pod, just sitting down, sitting here thinking about some of the whiskey that we've been been uh, privy to, being a part of the sponsor here on our show, Herman Marshall Whiskey. You guys get a chance to drink this stuff, try it out. The single malt is by far the best one they have. There's four kinds. They have a single malt, they have a blend, they have a bourbon, they have a rye. The order I would go in is a single malt by far. I just found this. Don't ever try and take this from me. I might have to beat you with the bottle. Then the rye, the blend, and then the bourbon. This stuff is phenomenal. Texas made and Texas produced here, guys. This stuff is unbelievable. So if you get a chance to do it, go grab yourself a bottle. This stuff is amazing. Hey, welcome to another edition of the Big Head Pod here on the Dub Network. Today's guest, a fan favorite for my favorite team growing up. Spent a lot of time in the city of brotherly love, two-time gold glove winner, world series champion, and all around guy, you see him, he always seems to have a smile on Mr. Larry Boa. Larry, how are you, sir? I'm doing fine, Kev. How are you doing? I am good. I'm good. It's, you know, I miss seeing you, you know, living down here in Texas. I don't get a chance to see a lot of the Philly networks and stuff, but, you know, seeing you on, um, on the TV shows and then, uh, running around coaching anymore so you've gotten away from the coaching side now and just more of a special assistant type of deal correct right right i'm, I'm special assistant to uh to uh dave dombrowski and uh we're getting ready for the uh trade deadline obviously at the end of the month but uh it's, it's a good gig really uh when they're at home i go to all the home games when we're on the road i go as you know the the, the minor league affiliates are in lehigh valley Reading, and jersey shore so everything's real close within an hour so I'm able to see some of our young kids also. Which is perfect. We'll, we'll get to that in a minute. But I'll go back to Larry Boa from California, kid. Were, were you <laughs> always a baseball guy? I mean, you know, you know, these old school players always played multiple sports. What, were you just a baseball guy only? I played baseball and I played a, a basketball. That was the only two. Uh, you know, I was around baseball since I was about five years old because my dad, he played, he got as high as AAA and he managed in the Cardinal organization. So I remember having a bat and ball in my hand ever since I was able to walk. But uh, California is a great place to be raised. You can play baseball all year round out there. And uh, to be honest with you, the very first time I ever left California was when I went to Sp uh, spring training in Florida. Uh, my very first year we played, uh, I played in Spartanburg, South Carolina, but our spring training was in Florida. So first time away from home and it was it was a uh, it was different no question about that yeah that, that's kind of how it was for me being being a delaware kid and never going west of the mississippi until i got drafted by texas um you know so, so doing that i was reading up on a little bit i uh i read up you went to sac city Sac for, city i, I, I played that, with some, I was played with say, some guys in a cape from up there from sac city okay. i think barry zito was a guy and that was barry a sac city guy I can't remember, but I played with guys in Chatham that were from, and I've never even heard of it. Right. It was a pretty good baseball school back in the day. We had a lot of guys sign out of there. The funny thing about that is, Kevin, I didn't play high school. I got cut every year, and I had to play in a <laughs> summer league. And the junior college coach was watching the summer league baseball, and he came over and he says, hey, I want you to come out for our junior college team. And I, went, I laughed at him. I said, I didn't even play high school. How am I going to make your team? He says, I'm going to give you every opportunity to make the team. I said, great. So I went out and I played two years there. I made all conference. Uh, and that's where uh, he's, he's no longer living now. But Eddie Bachman, who was a big time scout for the Phillies, saw me, signed me. And uh, I guess the rest is history. I played uh, three years in the minor leagues. I went A, double A, triple A. Then went to the big leagues and ended up playing uh, 16 years in the big leagues. Uh, didn't get drafted. Went through the draft, no draft, uh, no high school ball. but. Uh, you know, I try to tell young kids, if you, if you really believe you're good enough and, and you have the desire and the want to, go after it, man. Just go after it. You never know what's going to happen. I know it's a little bit different now with the analytics because if I was playing now, I wouldn't even smell the field because I don't <laughs> yeah. analytic out. So uh, it's a different game now, but I, was, I, was, uh, I had the opportunity to play. In fact, when Eddie signed me, he said, to our general manager at that time, Paul Owens, he said, hey, the worst is going to happen here. We're going to sign him. We don't have to give him any money. He could be an organization guy and end up being a coach in the minor league system. So Paul Owens said, go ahead, go for it. And that's how I got signed. And what year was that? <laughs> that was in 66. 
66. So you were 18 at the time? Yeah. 19? Yeah. 18. Okay. Yeah. Wow. And, and for that, like you talk about not playing at all. And, and then somebody says they want to sign you to a kind. I mean, if that, I don't even think that's even fathomable these days to for, for an, somebody to come up and go, you want to play? I've never played before. Okay. To take a <laughs> chance like that. I know. I mean, he, he, you know, he, he said, Hey, you skill out. Oh, I don't know if you're going to hit. He said, he says, you can catch it. You can throw, you can run. He says, uh, there's always going to be a place at that time, middle infielders, you know how it was short second center and catcher, catch the ball, let the corners and the big boys like yourself hit the ball out of the ballpark. And it was defense up the middle. Uh, and I'll be honest with you. I couldn't hit a lick. Uh, you know, I through hard work and dedication, great coaches, I ended up getting over 2,000 hits in the big leagues. And, uh, you know, I look back on it, and it's a lot of it is luck, being at the right place at the right time. In the early 70s, the Phillies were rebuilding, uh, mm. weren't going anywhere. Frank Casey, who was my manager in AAA and AAA, happened to be the new manager of the Phillies. He knew what I could do. I started off brutal, believe me. And he called me in one day. He says, I don't care what you hit. You're the shortstop the rest of the year. And from then on, you know, I started believing more working harder and things sort of fell into place for me. So, so your minor league affiliates, where, where'd you go for those three years? Spart- Spartanburg, South Carolina was a ball Reading, Pennsylvania, which is okay, still, Redding was was still a. Okay. And then Eugene, Oregon, which I love playing there in triple a it's no longer our triple a our triple a now is in Lehigh Valley, but, uh, three great places to play. Uh, I mean, I couldn't ask for a better thing. And the thing is we won championships in all three places. So, you know, I got that label as, hey, everywhere we go, he wins. And that helped me, obviously, being a little guy. If I had your pop, there's no telling how much money I would have made. But, <laughs> yeah, I you think, know, yeah, there, we all, time, especially you know, now. You know, at that time now, there was there was needs for guys like myself, uh, catch the ball, learn how to get bunts down, hit and run, steal bases. Uh, it's starting to come back a little bit, the stolen bases. Uh, guys putting the ball in play. I, I'm watching the kid from Miami. Uh, the first thing RM leagues, people said, well, he doesn't have a, a launch angle, his exit velocity. I said, yeah, but he's hitting 400. Uh, we're talking about a Reese. I said, yeah. I'll take a guy hitting 400. He gets on base. He makes things happen. So maybe it's going back a little bit, which I hope it does. Hey, don't get me wrong. I managed, I coached, I played. Three run homers are the greatest thing in the world. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, exactly. You can get a couple runs and boom, one of the big guys hit it. But if you really go back and look at all the playoff games and World Series, they're not ten to nine or eight to seven. It's three to two, two to one. It's good pitching, good defense, stealing bases, moving runners, and hopefully it'll come back. There's yeah. my dog just going. No, crazy. You're good. <laughs> oh, yeah, uh, you know you talk about Frank well, Casey. He lives here. Well, he was living here. I'm not sure if Frank's still right, around. He he, yeah, he lives. <laughs> and I used to talk to Frank about that all the time. So you talk about. You know, coming through with Frank being a manager, early 70s, uh, you, those Phillies years were tough, right? And then yeah. I was looking through it, and then the big trade happens in 72, right? They right. bring in Lefty, and they bring in Steve, Steve Carlton. Carlton. Yep. For, uh, and it seemed, was that the year that Schmidt was drafted? Was Schmidt drafted yes. in 72? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So then now these guys. About that. But anyway, the, Steve Carlton pitched that year. I believe we won 58 or 59 games. He won 27 games. And people asked me, they said, what was it about him when he got on the mound? I said, well, first of all, when he came in, the only thing he would say is today's win day. And nobody said a word to him. And the other thing is, at that time, we weren't very good hitters. We were very, weren't very disciplined. But we knew if we got two runs, we had a chance to win two to one. We could win one to nothing with him on the mound. But the fact that he won 27 of the 58 or 59 games is something I look back on and I shake my head and I go, that's almost impossible to do. But getting back to the Schmitty story, this he reminds me of this all the time. So, you know, when you get drafted, he was the number and first round pick. So they fly him into Philly and we're at the vet. And, you know, when you, in pregame, you're taking ground balls. And I felt somebody behind. He signed as a shortstop. So I felt somebody behind me and I turn around and says, Hey, uh, Larry Bowen, he's on Mike Schmidt. I said, yeah, I know you are. You know, I, I read all the clippings. <laughs> and I said, you want to take some ground? He says, yeah. I said, okay. And I said, sure. So he's taking ground balls and flipping them and everything. And we're doing that about 10 minutes. And towards the end, I said, oh, by the way, you might have to play another position because I plan on staying here for a long time. <laughs> he brings that up to me all the time. And to this day, I tell him, I said, you, you should be glad because 
your knees might have blown out playing short. You went over to third, greatest third baseman ever in, in baseball, him and Brooks Robinson. But uh, he relates that story to me all the time. He said, you remember that comment you made to me? I said, yeah. He said, did you really mean that? I said, believe me, Mike, you're the first round pick. I felt my days were numbered when I saw you take BP, take ground balls. So it was just false bravado at that time. (laughs) (laughs) Schmidt is a very kind of down to earth guy. He's not very, very low key. I mean, he has a smile on his face and you see him and it's just been, he's my favorite player growing up as a kid, as a kid um, and seeing that, but I got a chance to meet him and sit down, even a chance to sit down with with Steve Carlton, just talking, but hearing him talk. And like you said, just that demeanor that he had went about his business. Right. And you're playing in a tough city at this point. Right. (laughs) And I think that hurt Schmitty a lot because everything he did, it came. It, you put a ball in his hand, it could be golf ball, bowling ball, football, basketball. The greatest athlete that I've ever seen, as soon as he, you, you go bowling, he bowls 250. You, uh, and he goes golf and he's a scratch golfer. But I think the city here thought that he was too aloof. His first year, he didn't hit 200, but he hit, you could see the pop. He had 20 home yeah. runs. This guy's good, and he had a great glove. But they interpreted that aloofness as he doesn't care. And believe me, I'd lockered right next to him for the whole time. He cared as much as anybody that ever put on that uniform. But I think things came so easy for him that the fans, you well know, Philly fans, they want to see that dirt all over your uniform. They want to see you throwing a bat if you punch out. And Schmidt wasn't that kind of player. And eventually they warmed up to him, but it's almost like it was too late. It was the end of his career. Now they adore him every time he, he takes the field, he gets standing ovations, he comes back for alumni weekend. Uh, he had a just he had a great career and he was a great guy to play next to. I was very fortunate. I really I look at it, I had three Hall of Famers. I had Schmitty, I had Carlton, and I know Pete Rose isn't in there because of various reasons, but he's taken four over four thousand hits. That yeah. speaks for itself on what exactly. he did. Exactly. Yes. He deserve he definitely deserves to be in the in the right. hall. And like and that group, you know, you talk about going through this, the seventies teams where the struggle and then uh boom, Dallas Green pick comes in. Delaware guy right. comes in, right? I don't know. The Carpenters had owned the team at that that mo that time yeah, as well, right? right? right. Great owners. Yes. Yeah, I know David and Bobby because they went to school with my brother at Delaware. So right. yeah, I knew right. Rooley for a while. Yep. So those guys come in, did they did they trade for Rose? I don't remember. Was that was he a free agent? Okay. Free agent. See, we won. We won in 76, 77, yeah. 78, and we were short. And there was something missing, Kev. You know, you, you, you're, when you're on a team, and we all came up together in the minor leagues, all, yeah. the, the core group, Booney, Bull, me, and Schmitty. We learned how to win together. And then in the early 70s, we were getting our butt kicked. We learned how to lose, too. But there was a missing ingredient. And, um, you know, Ruli even said to us, he says, what if we get Pete Rose here? And, of course, all of a sudden, we played against Pete. In fact, in the playoff games, we lost to two great teams out of the four playoffs, the Dodgers and the Big Red Machine. So we got a firsthand glimpse of what Pete's all about. We said, you ain't going to get Pete Rose to come here. And he says, well, we might. And lo and behold, they got Pete here, and he was like the missing part of the puzzle. And, of course, Dallas bringing his demeanor. We had Danny Ozark, who was very low-key, great guy. He got us so far, then Dallas came in. You talk about different personalities. Yes. Wow. And he rubbed some guys the wrong way. He didn't bother me at all. Because if he wanted to yell at me and say, hey, you got to get this done, or blah, 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 I went out and did it. But we had a couple of guys that were a little sensitive, and they didn't know how to take him. But I look back, and Pete and Dallas were the two guys that, to me, gave us that little push to take us to the World Series in 1980. And that just, I think through that, that, that late seventies, early eighties, those teams were just typical Philadelphia blue collar teams. I mean, like you talk about, you talk about, you talk about Bob Boone behind the plate, right? Just right. a blue Pete Rose. This, I mean, everybody goes the Pete Rose slide, you know, know. you, you know, Schmitty. Um, I'm trying to think yeah. of our, the, the big, outfield big, group. Big Bride, uh, Gary Maddox in center, yep. Manny Trujillo in second, Lazinski in left. I mean, we, we could be one, plus, we could be eight, seven. We, we had good defense. We could steal bases. We had really a, a real good team that could beat you in so many ways. But, you know, we kept coming up short. And then finally we got that thing going. And uh, that city was the last month and a half there was off the charts. And then the parade and everything. Unbelievable. And you, but you guys were doing it the right way. You were doing that the small, you know, you talk about the bunt and hitting guys, you know, moving guys around, doing stuff, right. guys that could play defense. I think I remember the people who say, 
if the earth is covered, three quarters of the earth is covered in water, who covers the rest? Gary Maddox. Yeah. Yeah. He was, he was unbelievable. And you, and you know, the thing about that was, is the core group came up through the system. Now it seems like teams that win that, well, now you're starting to see it with Cincinnati and Baltimore, the way they're playing now, their guys are getting going through the system and they're producing prospects. It's tough to sign checks every year, free agents. You got to start getting people through your system to fill in some gaps. It's nice to have a Pete Rose. It's nice to go get Bryce Harper, but you can't keep doing that every year. And I think we're in a position now where uh, Don Mattingly's son uh, took over our farm system. We're still a ways off, but it's much better than it was. And if we can start, you know, getting some guys coming through the system, because as you well know, when you go through a system, you know what the guy's pluses and his minuses are. When you go out in free agency, you don't know the guy's history. And all of a yeah. sudden, in the middle of the year, you're going to go, God, I didn't know we got this guy. This guy's, he, he really is not into it. Or, you know, but when you when these guys come up through your system, you know the, 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 the pluses and the minuses by the time they get to Philly. Yeah, and, that, and that's, you, you talk about that, but, and you don't see, like Schmitty, entire career in Philadelphia, right? You don't see Tony Gwynn, San Diego, Cal Ripken, right. and Ball. You don't, you don't see that anymore. But as and as a player, you know, at that time, I mean, it, you know, the mentality I'm probably different than now. Of there, were, it seemed like there was no loyalty so much these days to a player, or was it more to the player to the organization that guys want to? I mean, look at Bobby Bo deferred his contract just so they could go get other guys. The, right. I mean, we don't see a lot of that. I mean, was that even something feasible when you were playing a guy deferring a contract or, or anything yeah. else to help? You know, when we played it, and again, it's a lot different, but the fan base here knew about all the prospects before we even got here. So they could relate. They could go to Reading and watch us play. They could go to uh, 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 Lehigh Valley now and they watch these guys play. So they have a feel of what the players are like. But at, back then, in the mid from mid seventy on, guys wanted to play in Philly. They knew it was a tough town to play, as you well know. It's a tough city. You oh, know, yes. you, it's the greatest feeling in the world. But when you do bad, you got to you got to man up. If you make an error, if you strike out three times, and you get in front of that camera, you got to say, you know what? I had a bad game. Hopefully, it doesn't happen again. Don't make excuses. It's a blue collar city. These people go to work at seven in the morning, come home at five at night. They want to see effort. And I try to tell our young kids, if you give effort every night, I'm not going to say they're never going to boo you, but by the time you end your career, if you do it consistently, you're going to be on their side. There's no doubt in my mind. Yes, and I and you know how the media there can can destroy oh, a player but, just yeah. like that, and it's because you know you've seen it just being around different sport guys running their mouth about the media in Philadelphia, right. and I, for my first thought is. You've just put the nail in your coffin because you don't do that. You sh like you said, you show up to work every day. You put in. Hey, you're gonna have bad days, right? But if you endear yourself to that city and understand, that, that's I always tell. It's that rocky mentality. You're gonna get knocked down, but you get back up. You keep fighting, right? So I mean, you're spent that. You know, you've like you talk about how bad it was for you early in the '70s, and now all of a sudden you guys get to the World Series, right? And and now you're you you've built this now, and th and that just. It, but it was seemed like it was cyclical, right? That late eighty or early eighties, the Eagles were struggling in the early seventies. Now right. they're they're playing they're getting play Flyers that just won a few Stanley Cups, right? right. And Sixers are in the final. So and now here you guys are. And like you talk about a time to be a Philadelphia sports fan in that eighties era, you were a, 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 among that. Of, you know, back, those four teams you name, they all got to the finals. We yep. were the only one who won it. Sixers yep. got to the finals, Eagles got to the finals. Flyers got to the finals. And you talk about a city that there was no time in between, you know, usually in between sports, they can complain about, oh, this team's bad. They didn't know what to do. Every team was was successful. And, you know, you talk about manning up. Go back to Alex Baum, if you remember, mm -hmm. when he says, I hate this place. Remember, uh, in fact, it was, I think, in Boston. We were playing an uh, interleague game. He threw a ball away, got booty when I hate this place. The next day he came out and said, I was wrong. I was, it was out of, uh, I, I was frustrated. I wasn't playing the way I should have. I apologize. Now, every time he comes up, he gets these big ovations because he manned up. If he had hit and said, and that, that video would have been out every time he went bad, that video would have been shown. But now they, they treat him like, Hey, he's one of the guys. Yeah. And, and, and you're right. It's, and you think about it, everything is right there on broad street, broad and Patterson. Everything is right there. It is. And, and it's, and that's the beauty of it. People ask, I said, you don't have to go anywhere. Everything is on one block and that, and the sports passion 
you, you know, as a fan base, you look at a lot of these teams, regardless, you know, win or lose, but they're, they tend to, tend to be forced more to the north. The fan base is there. You could be bad. They're going to show up. You're good. They're going to be there. You know, it's not the thing to do. Sometimes, some of the right. places in the south, it is that way. Like I said, so you've been around. You've been, you know, you know. after you're done playing, you go manage your coaching. You're in L.A., right? Yeah. Coaching in they L.A. and seeing. They, they come in the third and leave in the seventh. Yes. Yeah. So, but they come out, but they don't, you don't, very seldom see booing. You don't see booing in St. Louis. But you go to Philly, New York, Boston. I'm telling you, you're under the microscope. And the only thing I can say to these guys that come up is give 100%. That's the easiest thing to do is play hard. Other stuff's hard. It's hard to hit it. It's hard to catch it. It's hard to make pitches. But the easiest thing to do is effort. And if you do it on a consistent basis, day in and day out, eventually you're going to you're gonna win them over. Uh, obviously, you know, you have to have some ability. you got to be there a while. But if you do it the right way, they're going to eventually like you. Yeah. So you get out of, you know, you finish playing. It, it was your first thought to go, I want to go coach. Yeah, I know you talked about before that they said you could be an organizational guy and coach. I mean, so, you know, when you're done playing, you, you know, you, you finish, was it 85? Uh, 84. 84. 84. Yeah, okay. 85. 85. Okay. Yeah. And you're done. And, and so do you want to get into coaching or is it just, you know, some people, they pick one. Ah, do I, do I, do I not? How, what avenue? I mean, we know the avenue you took, but what? kind of led you in the direction you went. I told you baseball was my life and I wanted to stay in it. In fact, I had a chance at the end to be a utility man for the Cubs because they got me the last month of my career. You know, when you go the last month where you expand Rosh, they said, we're going to pick up Bo, the Cubs let him go. And so I played on a part-time basis and Frank Cashin was a GM at the end of the year. He says, Hey, I want you to come back as a utility player. And you know, the, the, the five, six, seven games I played in that month, there were balls that were hit to me that, in my mind, I knew I got to catch, and they, I just wasn't making the plays. And I didn't want to play utility. I, I just I was used to playing every day, and I appreciated the opportunity. I said, I think I'm going to call it a career. And be, be, within two weeks after that, uh, uh, Jack McKeon calls me up. He was a GM of, of, of the Padres. He says, hey, do you want to stay in baseball? I said, yeah. And he says, I got a job in, in uh, uh, Las Vegas, our AAA team. I want you to manage. And I went, whoa. Wow, right out of the gate, I'm going to go to AAA. I said, yeah, I'm all in. Well, I went there. We won the championship. And hindsight being 2020, if I could have stayed there a couple of years, it probably would have been better for me. But as soon as we won the championship, Jack says, hey, I want you to manage San Diego. And I went, whoa, man, this this is a fast track right here. And there's not too many guys that say, you know what, I think I'll stay in Vegas. I'm not ready. But, you know, looking back. I probably should have stayed in the minor leagues a couple more years, but it it was a learning experience. We had a young team. We didn't win right away. And, of course, the owner at that time wanted to see results, and it didn't work out there. And then eventually I ended up coaching, and eventually the Phillies asked me after Terry Francona got fired here, and nothing against Terry. Terry's a great manager. They, They had a bad team. I mean, they were losing 100 games, 98 games. And Eddie Wade, who was, uh, the GM, he says, um, what are we going to do? we got to change the attitude here. He says, these guys are used to losing. They're getting too used to it. So they brought me in, and in 2001, 2, 3, and 4, we played 500 every year. We got close in one year of the playoffs, but the attitude changed, and then eventually they took, Charlie took over, and they won a World Series in 08, got there again in 09. But the whole deal was the culture changed. Uh, we started getting guys through the system in Utley and Jimmy Rollins and Ryan Howard. And, again, we talk about – going through the system, using your minor league guys, and it was a pretty good baseball team. So that's the word. I, I really always wanted to be involved in baseball, whether it be – if it wasn't a professional, I would have liked being a coach somewhere in a, in a high school or whatever. But baseball has been my whole life. I've been very blessed by the man upstairs. Uh, the Phillies in particular uh, have given me opportunity after opportunity. And, again, you have to be lucky and you have to be at the right place at the right time. And things have worked out pretty good for me. Yeah, Tito was my bench coach my first year in 02. Good baseball uh, I think he had left. Yeah, because you had taken over in 01, correct? Right. And then, he yeah, I think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So then he was my bench coach. And then he goes on to. I'll, actually, I'll see him this week there. I think Cleveland's in town. Um, but, see, you know, seeing that, guys, and you talk about the culture a little bit of changing, you know, that we have this old school and this new school mentality. The old school seem, t- tends to be about. Team. The new school tends to be about individuals. So, I mean, you play with guys who probably, if you step to the line, we're probably going to punch you in the face. 
back no in the day, right there. Yeah. No question. Yeah. And I think that's, but that's that mentality of, of, I think it was just how our generation was raised of watching that. And I think that's, that's gone by the wayside, but as, so as a manager, you know, how do you combat that when, when your mentality is this, this old school and I know, like I said, I came through with all the, with Ryan and Chase and all those guys playing. They were an old school type of player too. Yeah, they right? were. And, yeah. and they, and that's what, like you said, it, 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 think it, it endeared to the city of Philadelphia. You said led to the World Series. And these guys were able to, you know, new ballpark. You know, you guys leave um, Veterans Stadium. What was it? Oh, was it oh one? Lost we uh, in oh uh, four. Oh four. Okay. Oh, you know, four, doing that. Citizens Bank. Yep. Yep. And doing but that you, and. Thing about that, Kev, is uh, the old school. You know, we all know the games change, as you well know. You played, in fact, you probably played with some old school guys, and you saw the change coming and everything. Back in the day, even with Chase and Jimmy and those guys, those guys would police themselves. You know, yeah. you didn't need a coach to jump in. Just like when we played, uh, I remember just vividly. I mean, I had spent some years in the big leagues. I had made five All Star teams, and Pete Rose was on the team, and there was a situation that came up where the bunt was on for me and I didn't get it done before I got to the dugout. I said, you got to get that bunt down. You got to do that. I mean, this was in front of the whole team. And I said, you're right. I didn't do it. You're right. But I mean, stuff like that happened all the time. Now it's more like coaches have to be the bad guys. Cause guys, guys very seldom discipline themselves now. I mean, as far as other guys, they take care. Like you said, Hey, I got worried about myself. I sure I want to win every night, but I'm taking care of myself. I can't, I can't worry about Joe Schmo if he's not running balls out. That's up to the coaches. So the game's changed that way. Um, and again, you know, if you're a baseball guy, which I am and I know you are, you got to change with it. I mean, there's some rules now that I scratch my head at, but <laughs> it's different now. It's different. I mean, I look at when you go into second base, I remember guys trying to knock me into left center field. I remember catchers getting knocked down knocked out at home plate on collisions and now you have the rule second you can't touch the guy you got to give the guy lane um you know again i'm not mad at it but it, that's how the game has changed a lot and do you like it i don't i still don't like it but i watch it because i love baseball it's a different game now it, you know you talk about running the catcher and every everything always goes to, i remember talking to ray fossey when we were oh. going to oakland when pete ran him in the all-star game all-star game Yes. Yep. Yeah. But that's, I mean, so, so when you see that as a player and, and then Pete's on your team, you know, that's, Hey Pete, what, you know, what were you thinking at that moment? Is he ever, did, you, did you ever have a discussion with him to say, Oh yeah. He said, my main, my main job was make sure he didn't get, tag me out and I wanted to get to home plate, but you know, getting back to the all-star game, you know what? They put on a great, great show in Seattle, but it's so much different now. We used to have the presidents of each league, a national league guy come in and say how important this game is. American league guy would, it was it was reg it was with besides the World Series, this game, it was very competitive. Guys didn't like each other. We didn't like the American League, they didn't like us. Yeah. And the the, the, the eight or nine games when I was in baseball, six out of five of them I played we won every game. And now just recently, the National League yesterday, day before, they finally broke the streak and they won. But it's more like a it's it's more like a showcase game now. Uh you don't see guys knocking people down or in fact, one one teal, I saw Kurt Schilling pitching once, and he threw one up and in. And he goes like went like this, like my bad. And I'm going, man, I can't even imagine Nolan Ryan throwing one up and in and going my bad. <laughs> Those guys yeah. didn't play. It was just yeah. the mentality was different. I mean, I'm glad I played when I played, but I I do respect the players playing now. They're fast, they're strong, they throw hard, and they're fun to watch. But the the way the game is played is a lot different than when we played. Yeah. You know, like you talk about Jimmy Rollins, the leadoff batters, getting guys over, you know, right. hit and run, hitting behind them, got guys, you know, driving runs in. But that, and that's just, it's gone. You know, a guy like you, it's so, so a Larry Boa type player today is expected to hit 25 home runs and strike out right. 200 times. Right. No chance. Uh, and again, it's, it's the way that teams are, are sort of setting up their, their rosters now. But I look at, at Miami, and I watch that team, and I've watched them a lot because they're in our division. They always had pitching, but they couldn't do anything. Now I'm watching them play. They're putting the ball in play. They're moving runners. They're sacrificed bunting. And Schumacher's done a great job with that team. I don't know what they're going to do in the second half, but their pitchers are throwing well. I watch teams like that. Then I watch I watch the World Series when, when we played Houston last year. I see guys laying down bunts. I saw hit and runs. I saw stolen bases. 
Now, all of a sudden, when you play 162 games, we don't do any of that. But now when it gets down to the nitty gritty, we're, we're doing everything. And just like the, the ghost runner at second base. <laughs> First of all, but we put a ghost runner out there all year. But now when the playoffs and World Series start, we don't have a ghost runner. We play the game, which I think, I mean, you saw the Seattle game last year. What was it, 18 innings? Seattle and Houston in a yeah, playoff. Well, not- and Houston won one to nothing. But But that. That's baseball. With but 40 strikeouts or something. Unbelievable. Stupid. Strikeouts were off the charts. But it's it just, it, you know, if you're going to use the rules, use them all year. Don't just, oh, we're playing for money now, big time money. We're playing for rings. So we're going to forget the ghost runner. Uh, just like now they're, they're comparing a stolen base rate. It should be high. You only throw over there twice if you don't get them. They're gone. Let Ricky Henderson, the guys, Ricky Henderson, Vince Coleman, Lou Brock, let them play under those rules. They'd have 200 stolen bases every year. And but, that's what I said the other day. They're still, it's yeah. a pizza box. It's 75 <laughs> feet between bases. Of course, this guy's with well, De La Cruz, the guy from the Reds, are talking how great yeah. he I said, Ricky would have 60 stolen bases in his first 15 games if that's how you played. <laughs> See, and then you put the oven mitt on, you got bigger oh. bases. <laughs> other four. How many times is it bang, bang on a throw to second? They got a bigger base, they got the oven mitt, and the guy doesn't throw the guy out. So there's so many. It's just so different now. But don't compare. I, I hear these these sports guys. Oh, stolen bases are up, and I'm going. They should be. They should be way up. But uh, don't take away what guys back in the day did, like Ricky and Lou Brock and Vince Coleman, uh, guys like that. Don't take away what they did because what they did was something very special, and it was a lot harder to do. Yeah, for sure. And I and, and I get that. You know, you just but you you want you talk about like the purity of the game, the the records and the rule picking off these guys. It's I we had to talk about this the other day about players are not reactive. They're not proactive. They're reactive. They almost have to be told what to do. They don't let their instinct. But you think about it, you see it guys in the dugout looking at a computer and iPad. How so as a player, how did you learn best? Would, would you have been on the iPad or would you no. would actually have conversations with people in the dugout? We would have conversations. Guys would uh, guys would be in the dugout saying, "Hey, you know, when this guy throws a breaking ball, watch his glove; it's going to flare a little bit." But it was always watching. And even the guys that weren't playing every day, they were on the bed. They weren't upstairs. They were watching the game, trying to get an edge. Uh, but like you said, now a guy makes an out, and right away they go to the iPad. Uh, when I was coaching, we started having the iPads and everything. And I remember a guy coming in. And uh, the hitting uh, the, uh, hitting coach at that time was Matt Stairs, and we had no information on on this guy coming. He got got called up. We don't know what he threw. We didn't have the the advanced stuff they have now. And the guy, what does he throw? I got to know what he throws. And Matt says, "Watch him warm up. He's going to go fastball, curveball, change up. Watch him warm up." They turn their back to him. And now I watch these guys, and they look at the iPad. A pitcher is when he's warming up, coming out of that bullpen. He's going to tell you his pitches. He'll go split. He'll go change up, slider. You don't, you don't need all – I mean, sometimes I think that information is great. But I think sometimes, as you well know, overload can kill you sometimes. You you start thinking up there, oh, this guy never throws a fastball and the counts 2-0. and He's 90% breaking ball. So now you get up there and you're thinking, okay, I'm, I'm not even looking – I'm not even looking fastball. You're looking break, breaking ball. And the guy throws him down the middle and goes, how can you take that pitch? Because it's, you can't re- – I mean, it's good stuff, but I don't know how you hit. I'm, I'm sure – not, I mean, knowing you the way I do, I'm sure you hit off, off the fastball. That, guys, that's what I was taught. My that's how coach we, taught me. You, you, you hit off the guy's most velocity, and then you make adjustments. And Unless I, it was I, a Jamie Moyer guy throwing I, 78 miles an hour. Then, yes. Right. Well, I mean, when you faced a Jamie Moyer, I guarantee you one thing, you didn't stand way in the batter's box. Back in the bat, you moved up because the ball's it change up or he has a sinker. These guys stay in the same place every time. I asked Bryce Harper once, I said, when you face a real good sinker baller, do you ever think about moving up? And he looked at me like I had 10 heads. He goes, no. I said, well, I know you're a great hitter. I said, but he goes, what was your philosophy? I said, well, I want to get that thing before it starts biting too much. He goes, yeah, I never thought of that. He says, but I, he says, that doesn't bother me at all. And I said, but you're a great hitter. So, but I mean, little things like that. We used to look at that stuff. Pete Rose used to say that, move up on it, move up in the batter's box. He's not going to throw the fastball by you. Move back with Nolan Ryan pitch. Move as far back as you can get. You know, get a good look at it. But uh, those were things that you did verbally with each other. We didn't have iPads in, and we didn't have the information they have now. Which is, like I said, I think there's great information out there, but sometimes it's overkill. 
How many times have you had a coach say, see ball, hit ball? Forget all the other stuff. See the ball, hit the ball. And sometimes it works. And other times just, you're 0 for 18. Doesn't matter what you're doing, you're not getting a hit. Yeah, but that's that it, makes the game so great, I think. Yeah, because you wanted to. And, and I remember we didn't have you know a lot of that stuff. But, hey, oh, yeah, I saw this guy in the minor leagues when, you know, what he would throw. Like you said. So you have to learn that way and figure it out. You know, you're looking – you're watching a game. You see the bullpen. You see balls flying all over there. No, this guy's coming up, and you're going, "Oh, great! There's a righty throwing a hundred. It's all over the place." Yeah, who's coming up? Yeah, you are. So you better be ready, as opposed to looking at an iPad and seeing him throwing it in the box every time. You, you, and you get a I, feel I, for the game too. You do. It. That's why I, I sort of like. I was getting into the this, the uh, the shift. I mean, I, I, I my belief is if you can't move the ball the other way, but the more I see this, no shift. I see more athleticism in the middle of the diamond. Guys, are, you see more range. You see guys backhand and balls. Um, and I think overall, instead of having three guys on one side, you're going to see shortstop making some great plays or second baseman making some great plays. But I try to tell, I got in a little bit of trouble two years ago. You know, we have the cards. And I said, instead of giving our low A guys cards, let them learn how to read swings. Let them learn how to play counts. In the end, you got a guy like yourself hitting third or fourth in the lineup, and the count's 2 0 or 3 1. Man, I, I don't even have to walk. I'm look, I'm moving over because I know he's looking for one thing. He's trying to hit this ball 900 feet and, and get out in front of something. But mm -hmm. if these kids learn how to read swings and do it as they graduate, now, as you get a little bit higher, you want to get more sophisticated, start giving out that information. But when you're in low A, let these guys learn. That's how you, you learn by the mistakes you make. Uh, but they go out there and right away they pick, oh, Straight away. Oh, two, two, two steps to pull. Learn how to read the hitter. Guy's throwing 98. Maybe the next time he's out there, he doesn't feel good or he had a fight with his wife. He's throwing 93. I'm going to make some adjustments. <laughs> Game of adjustments. I mean, it's something they don't, the, the analytic people don't take that into consideration. Your kid might be sick. You might not have got any sleep that night. The pitcher doesn't feel it. But these, you can't put all that. It's not one size fits all. You don't throw all this stuff in a computer. It's a game of adjustments, and you as a player got to make those adjustments. You're right, because you and that, but that's just a visual thing of knowing how guys feel, what they're right. They, you know, guys, you know, you play middle infield, so you know, Booney's catching. You're trying to pick up signs, right? So you know to make an adjustment. Center okay. fielders kind of do the same thing. I mean, do, do right. you even do guys even talk to you about that nowadays? As far as playing the middle infield, I tell my young kids, guys, try and pick up the signs to know one situation, guy out their base. Less than two outs, where pitchers probably pitching in. So you know your, your movement's going to be more to your right side than anything else. Seeing pitches, do you guys have that discussion with you? I mean, being you know coaching, yeah. or is it just uh, all right? Card says this, and that's it. There's some guys that do ask questions, but the majority it's the cards. But you know, I, I just think I look at it this way: when you're playing the infield, and as you said, there's situations that are going to come up. When you got the infield in, and as you said, I want if I'm a pitcher, I want to roll over a ground ball to third base. So, you know, in your mind, you're saying, this guy's going to, my pitcher's going to do this. I hope the hitter tries to roll over. If he's a good hitter, he's probably going to stay in the middle of the field. But again, these are things that I don't think we talk enough about it. I try to tell young kids, if you're playing the corners and the short sub and second baseman, if I'm playing first or third, I want to know when a changeup's coming. You know, yeah. I, if I'm the shortstop, I used to tell Schmidt all the time, we had a little sign verbally, like off speed or change up. So mm -hmm. he's ready. You know, he gets somebody gets out in front of the change up, the ball gets down there. First base, same way, you're holding the runner on. If I'm playing first, I want to know if a big power hit and left hand left handed hitters up, if a straight change is coming. So I'm I'm ready. I'm already yeah. locked in. These guys, they don't like giving signs. I don't know I don't know why. Um Maybe because in college they didn't do it. I, I don't know. It's just because Schmidt used to say a couple times I'd miss. He'd go, hey, it was a changeup, right? And I said, yeah, I didn't, didn't put his glove down there too soon. But, but you know, he wanted to know. And, you know, yeah. which I, I respect that part of it. And you played on that concrete turf as well at Betcher Stadium. That, it's like playing at the airport. Yes. <laughs> I, oh, my God. I, I can't imagine how hard that stuff was back in the day. And, and base, those guys hitting balls. And like you said, Schmidt, he's playing – He's playing in, and all of a sudden he's looking at you for for oh, that big, big boy hit on Jim Rice or or Baylor or when we played Dave Kingman was one of those six yep. foot six guys. They were trying to get the head out, and Gary Carter, Dawson, all those guys. I mean, 
My he said, Bo, I want to know. I said, I'm going to give you every time I see it. I'm going to give it to you. Yeah, but, and and but and that's just it's funny that you don't that guys don't have those conversations, especially with if I'm a short to hey hey Larry, what do you what's your thoughts on this? You know, I played in the outfit, so hey, what are your thoughts on and and so is that what it is? I mean, do guys? I, I know as a coach, it's hard to instill what we learned you know to go seek people out do you do you have to do that more now than people actually saying hey coach Bo, yeah. what what do you I what do you think we need to do yeah but i think for the most part the young kids first of all this you're gonna laugh at this they they don't really know the history of philadelphia i mean i had a guy now i, I go to spring training i, I suit up every year <laughs> we we're talking one day and i said well mike schmidt he goes who's mike schmidt and i went oh my god Oh my God! Are you serious? <laughs> you know, I, he looked at me. I, I, he, I said he's the greatest player I ever played here, third base. He says, "Oh, that's why the field's name." I said, "Yeah, that's why there's a Mike Smith." <laughs> but, but see, they, they're so caught up. They don't. I, I'm a firm believer. I might be wrong on this. When a kid signs, I think whoever you sign in the draft, you take a bus, you go to Cooperstown, and you let them see the Philadelphia Phillies, all the people that played here. The history of the game, the guys that were great, the guys that were that, that won gold gloves or Cy Young winners. So I'll have an idea when somebody comes up to him and say, hey, man, you remind me of Mike Schmidt. He's not going to say, who's Mike Schmidt? He's going to say, oh, man, that's a great compliment. But if every team would do that, take their team, take their draft picks to Cooperstown, show them the, the display of the Philadelphia Phillies, who played there, when they played, who won World Series. It, it would, I think, it would be very beneficial, not only for the organization, but for the young kids coming up. Yeah, it's it, you're right. It's almost as if, other than themselves, and like you said, okay, the Phillies drafted me. All right, who are the Phillies and people? Wait, the Philadelphia Phillies just drafted me, and I'm playing for the Phillies. And the in the history of, like you talk, Mike Schmidt, Robin Roberts, Richie Ashburn, right. these guys that, that that kind of built this organization, as opposed to. Where, where am I going? I'm just here to, you know what I mean? It's, but is that this new school? It's just about me. Is that this, this, what, how the thought process is? I, I don't think, know. I mean, it's, it's tough. I think Kev, because of the travel squads and everything, think about these travel squads. They don't teach guys how to win. When you go to a travel game, they want to see your skills. So they want to get, they get everybody in right field and I'll throw, throw the ball as hard as you can to third base. The guys throw over the cutoff, man. But the guy goes, man, that's some good arm straight. They get in the batter's box. They're lifting and separating, trying to see how far they can hit balls. They they don't teach them the intricacies of playing baseball, the fundamentals of playing, playing baseball. It's the eighth inning, and you're hitting fifth, and a guy just hit a double. The score's tied. Hit a ball to the right side. I'm not asking you to bunt. You're a big guy. Try to hit a ball at least one or two strikes to the right side. Get the guy to third base. Uh, who was the guy that I was talking to? Uh, it was just recently, too. We were. To- it was about the shift. And God, I forget the kid's name. We were talking, and and Bobby Dickerson, who was the infield coach now, a great infield coach, we were talking to him. I know who it was. It was Scott Kingery. Scott Kingery, Bobby says, if it's the seventh game of a World Series, this is for all the marbles. The man in front of you just doubled. Score's tied. Can you hit me a ground ball there? And he looked at him dead serious. He says, no. My swing, my swing will not allow me to hit a ball there. And Bobby says, we're going for a ring. We're going for the best team in all of baseball. And you can't push a ball over there to get this guy to third. He says, that's not the way I swing. And I'm going, oh, my God. But, I mean, that's the mentality of I'm not changing my swing. That's why this kid, Reese, the reason I like him, you know, if you watch these pow- a lot of power, not all of them, they got a groove swing. And if those pitchers hit where that groove swing is, they're going to hit a long way. Yeah. But this kid gets the barrel to the ball, no matter where it is. It could be up. It could be down. It could be in. It could be out. Same with Pete Rose. Same with Rod Carew. Same with Tony Gwynn. They have that ability to get the barrel to the ball, not just one swing. You make adjustments. Counts 0-2. I'm battling. I'm spreading out a little bit. I'm letting the ball get a little deeper. But that barrel is going to get to the ball. And I think there's too many guys now that go for that groove swing. They're going to hit their 35. But a great example is Joey Gallo. This guy's got as much pop as anybody. I've I seen this guy a mile. Balls a mile. But it, it's, there's three things that can happen with this guy. He's going to strike out. He's going to walk or he's going to hit a bomb. 
He's a good outfielder, a real good outfielder. But but now the mentality of a lot of these general managers that put teams together, that's what they want. So if you're a young kid coming up and you know you're going to get paid buku money to hit balls over the fence, they don't care if you strike out as long as you get your walks. Hey, anyway, if I'm a young kid, I'm going to say, man, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to make some money playing in the big leagues. It's just the way the mentality is right now. And a lot of these GMs now, that's what they like. And I think we're starting to give it to go back a little. I don't think it's ever going to go back all the way. I mean, you still want your big boys in the middle of the lineup to hit yeah. balls in nine miles, but uh, it's it's just it's a different philosophy now. Yeah, and you talk about the fundamentals. That was something that seems like you took to almost personal. You know, the high, almost one of the highest fielding percentages ever in the National League with what you did. So, and and you and like I said, now you watching today's game. I see fundamentals are, are out the window. Oh. So how much does that eat at you to sit there and watch somebody where, I mean, I, I used to hear stories about like Ozzie Smith taking ground balls on his knees, not even looking, just flipping. And these, and now it's what, five grounders and I'm done? I mean, oh, I how do you sleep at night watching this? this is what I want to know, Larry. It's hard because, because I'm going to tell you right now, fundamentals, you, you watch it. Base running is horrendous right now. <laughs> I never seen I've never seen base running mistakes like this. But see, the difference, Kev, is I had to do that or I wouldn't have played. I had to do little things. And my dad always said, You're never gonna be a strong guy. You're gonna have to move runners, lay down a bunt, steal a base, make good plays. So that was embedded in my mind since I was able to pick up a baseball. You have to do this or you're not gonna play. Now it's if I hit three hundred or hit thirty home runs, uh eh, if I don't, if I'm not good defensively, it's okay. I'm going to put some runs on the board. Or if I'm not a good base runner, no big deal. A lot of games are one running the bases. I mean, it's unbelievable how you can win baseball games. Looking around, seeing how deep the right fielder is. A guy hits the ball by the first baseman. You shouldn't even pick up a coach. You know you're going first or third. I tell the guys when we're coaching with the Phillies, when you play at Wrigley Field and that ball's hit to the right side, the grass is this high. Don't even look. Just go to third. Don't even yep. look. You got to know the ball's going to stop because the grass is so high. And if you play on AstroTurf, it's going to be a little bit different. You got to pick up the third base coach. There's so many things. Getting secondary leads uh, with two outs and, and and at second base. Guys should never get thrown out at home plate if you have a good secondary lead. So you see it happen a lot. So, but again, it's the philosophy, and it's not it's not important. That part of the game is not important anymore. And until we start making it, when I say we, I'm talking about all of baseball. Until we start making that a priority, you're going to still see stupid base running mistakes, guys missing ground balls, not knowing how many outs there are, throwing to the wrong base, missing to the cutoff, man. These are all things that help you win baseball games. And again, do I love 300 homers? Manager, coach, player, I loved them. But they don't happen every night. you got to find ways to win games besides three-run home runs. Yeah, and that's that's especially in the postseason, right? These short series, you've got to figure out ways to, to get runs, put runs on the board, and do that. And that's it's just no. completely gone, right? Yeah. And like you talk about that seventeen inning game, I saw a couple guys get walked to leave. Somebody, but I don't care. Do you want to stay here all night? Just somebody figure it out. I mean, but that's what I mean. It, it almost as if, oh, well, then it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt my statistics. My numbers are going to be this. But I have a high war or whatever the hell these statistics they're throwing out there these days because that makes me – that makes my dollar sign go up because I have a higher no war. Question. No question. But, but you, know, you know, putting the, the ghost runner out there, I understand if you're the visitor, sometimes one run's not going to get it so you don't put a bun on. But when that team doesn't score a run in the top of the 10th, and you got the right people up there, like maybe your big boy, like Harper or, or Baum or uh, uh, Castellanos aren't hitting, but the, the guys towards the bottom, get the guy to third base. All we need is a run. But the analytics say the percentage of guys scoring with a man on third one out isn't that good. So, And, and the other thing that gets me on that, again, I like a lot of analytics stuff, but there's stuff when they tell you an out's an out. No, a strikeout, nobody handles the ball. You put the ball in play. Somebody's got to make a play, throw the ball over to first, or if a guy's going on contact, throw the ball home. There could be a mistake. But when you punch out, nobody has to handle the ball. You just take it back to the bench, put it in the rack, and now there's one out and the man's still in second. Just my question show, is my, – My deal is show me that you're trying to hit a ball to the right side. Now, after a strike and you didn't do it, go ahead. Go for yourself. But, God, give it an effort. That's all. Yeah, and you can tell what a guy's trying. You, huh? you can tell when a guy's trying to push a ball over there. Yes. 
trying to fight over there. So go, the Ghost Runner thing. We, somebody made a good point today. The Ghost Runner. Who gets credited with the run then? Who's it go against, right? It's an unearned run, supposedly. Well, it, is it? Yeah, I didn't know. That. I didn't know. It, that, that runner on second. So these guys that come in and give up that run, it's it's counted as an unearned. It's not on their, it's not on their <laughs> staff. So, again, <laughs> you know. The other thing that, that I see happen, and, and the, I know you watch baseball. There's a lot of balls hit now. They don't even they don't even give airs now. It's automatic hits. It's <laughs> unbelievable. And I've heard this comment, and again, I don't know if it's true because I go to all the games. Well, people in New York say if a ball's hit over 95 miles an hour, they want a, the hitter to be rewarded. So I said to the guy, I said, so another guy, guy hits me a ground ball and crushes it, but it goes right through my legs, and it was 97. He said, well, I'm just telling you, they want you to be rewarded for your exit velocity at 97. I'm going, oh, my God. So they want those batting averages up a little bit, I guess. <laughs> so no wonder fielding percentages are so high. I know <laughs> it. There's no air escape anymore. It's unbelievable. How about uh, another thing you talk about, like the one knee catcher stuff, doing that you know, you see that, especially with guys on third base. Third base? Well, well, I don't get it. You're trying to frame, but the ball's banking off the the, the screen. At home. I, I get it. You want to steal a pitch with a man on first or something. When that guy starts getting in scoring position, man, I, I, I'm ready for something to happen. The guy bouncing a breaking ball or something. Uh, but, again, I notice our catcher now, uh, JT, he doesn't do it as much as he did, which yeah. he's a great athlete. And I, I don't think he liked it. I, and I think he finally made it a point to say, I don't want to do this with a man on third base, so which yeah. is good. And you see it, especially the balls in the dirt, because they can't get over to block, especially a breaking ball. You're lucky. You're trying, yeah, you're trying to pick it and everything else. Can I mean, that's the hardest thing. You just, okay, that's probably the problem. I'm sure the analytics say, well, the probability of that run scoring is less than 3% or something. Exactly. But, okay, what about with a one-knee catcher? Was the percentage go up or anything else? So. <laughs> Question. I mean, they got they got numbers. They, they can make those numbers look any way they want, you know. Uh, but uh, that part of the game it really bugs you because, especially, you know, like you said, a guy's best pitch is a split or a good breaking ball, and he's got a kid guy one and two, and he sees your leg out there. He's going, oh man, he's getting right here. He goes, I want to bounce this, so he leaves it in the middle of the plate, and bam, it's in the I, seat. I never thought about that. Maybe that's what Naris's fault was. For all I, the- <laughs> I, I'm serious. I don't know. I mean, it's but. Again, they they always have answers for when you try to rebut what they're saying. Um, I, I used to argue with them, but now I just I go with the flow. Now it's like I said, I, I've sort of conditioned my mind to say it's a different game now and uh, enjoy it because there are there's some good athletes. It's fun to watch some of these guys play. It really is. It is, and, and you, you would like to see the, like, all the talents ex, you know ex, exploited as far as. You know, a guy, uh, somebody laying down a bunt just for the sake of it, just seeing what he can do. They, like this guy, Dale Cruz, lay down a bunt. Just, I just want to see what you can do, right? Because then all of a sudden, now you've changed the game completely. Of okay, he can bunt. You plant can, that seed, and you got the infield, the third baseman playing instead of playing twenty feet behind the bag, he's even with the bag. Now you get semi jammed on a ball hit to his left. It sneaks through for a hit, but they don't. They don't. They don't think that far ahead. I, I told a couple guys, just fake like your bunt. You, it, just plant a seed. You move the guy in a little bit. Now you, you don't get the barrel to the ball, but you get a ball between third and short, or if he's back 20 feet, it's five to three, and you're, you're heading back to the bench. Yeah, but, I remember doing that. That you was see all it. part of strategy, man, when you got in the ball. You turned around, you looked where everybody was playing, and normally when you, when you got in the box, you could tell by the way the outfielder is playing how the pitcher is trying to get you out. Stuff like that. I, I don't know if that goes on right now. I really don't. I mean, you but just seeing it though, that's and that's just the thing. I said, you know, the the managers though nowadays, you see there are a lot of old school guys around. Yeah. Ochi right. Thompson yep. in Philly. Um, yeah, Dusty Baker, Dave Roberts. You know, guys right. you've been around, and these guys are having six, the success of trying. You, you see them; they they're wanting to play the small. They, even some of the teams are built to play small ball. Right. So maybe they, that's in the back of their mind, but but you don't see a lot of it. Do, do you guys, I can spring train, do, are you seeing teams nowadays work on the bunting still, hitting and run, hit and run, any of that stuff? No. Nothing? No, I, I, I seen a couple guys that, I mean, our minor leagues now, they do it. They, they, okay. they, we have guys that can run a little bit, uh, affect our number one pick, uh, Crawford's son. 
he's going to be really good. I mean, this guy sitting about 325 in Clearwater, left-handed hitter, got some pop. He's still not big yet, but he's going. To, you can see he's going to grow. I see him dropping bunts. He goes in the half field and practices every day. But again, he's coming from a guy that had a lot of success at the big leagues. I'm sure his dad's saying, hey, this, you got to do some of this stuff. I know we're not going to say you're going to get singles because this guy can drive the ball, but he's always working on his game, which really impresses me because he's still really young. And he's like I said, this is his first year in a ball, a full season, and he's killing it right now. Uh, but he's a kid that asks questions, and you can see he's come from a background where guys, his dad taught him, hey, this is how you do this. And yeah. that was fun to see. Yeah, and I, and I first actually learned that being at Delaware. Um, actually, I played with Vuk's son, Vince. Oh, okay, yeah. And Vince came down, you know, and 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 Vuk would come down and, and talk and just see. But you could tell how Vince carried himself. Um, yeah. He carried even when Francona was there as well, coming down and just being able to actually to see these guys and being around. You're right, though, the the people that around, you, especially that played minor league ball, even they played in big leagues, played Triple A, all the you know you kind of see that and you get to pick up that feeling of understanding of, of what it takes. Right. Because, okay, if I act that way, all right, they were just that close. What do I need to do a little bit better? Right. right. And I think that form and molds these guys. And, and I'm sure you can tell, even, I mean, can you tell just sitting there watching a the game going that, that guy's had some professional help. He's had guys around him that it's kind of, yeah, you, you, you can tell. I use the phrase, in fact, I got one of the analytic guys one day. He was sitting with me watching a game, and there was a guy on another team, and I went, that guy's a gamer. And he looked at me and goes, what's a gamer? I said, a gamer is this guy don't make too many mistakes. He knows the situations. He knows where to be. He's always in the right place at the right time. That used to be a compliment. When a guy told you, hey, man, this guy's a gamer. You yeah. said, you, you had that label. You played the game hard. Hey, he's a gamer. Kevin Mitchell's a gamer. That was a compliment. I used that phrase, and the guy looked at me like, what do you mean a gamer? I said, well, hey, watch the game. This guy stands out. That stuff he does. That's, he's not hitting a lot of home runs, but he's doing all this other stuff. Making good plays, going first to third on balls, knowing the scoreboard. We're down five runs. He's breaking it down, not running with reckless abandon. When he's up, he's trying to make things happen. Those guys, that's hard to teach that. And when you see that with minor leaguers coming up, you really appreciate that. And you respect the guy saying, hey, this guy's got an idea how to play. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it's, you see, do you see anybody nowadays kind of at your style play? Do you ever do you see anybody a Larry Boa style player nowadays, or is that kind of gone by the wayside? I watched some video on uh, on this Wilson kid. His dad played for Pittsburgh, the shortstop. He he got who's a high pick. I think he won the first five. And I watched video on him. You could tell his dad taught him how to play. His dad never hit home runs, but this kid's got some pop. Yeah. But he does things the right way. They, they showed some video of him You're playing in uh, in college with a man on second. And you see him trying to hit the ball the other way. Uh, I like stuff like that. We have a couple of middle infielders in Clearwater now that I watch, and they're doing little things. Uh, so I think, like I said, I think the game is coming back a little bit because you're going to need those kind of guys to get the big boys their RBIs and the home runs and things like that. I always try to tell these little guys, if you hit at the top of the order, don't have a goal of hitting 300. Don't have a goal of stealing. Tell you, I want to score 100 runs. You score 100 runs and you're leading off, you're doing a whole lot of good things, and the guys behind you are doing damn damage. So if you're a little guy that can run a little bit, don't worry about all that stuff. I want to score 100 runs. And you'd be surprised that guys that score 100 runs, man, they, they do a lot of things right. Yeah, but you don't, you know, you know, you don't see a lot of that. No. Um, you know, so we got, we got workloads now. We don't let guys play every day. That's another going. <laughs> you gotta be kidding me, man! If I got three hits on a Sunday and Monday I'm not playing because the they said you got a workload, I'm going in there. Are you kidding me? I'm starting to feel good, man. I want to play every day. Now, if I'm over twenty five and you want to give me a day off, okay, but don't don't pull me out on a three for four where I squared some balls up. But again, it's all over baseball. They want to make sure you're strong going down the stretch. And uh, it's it's a philosophy. It's a different philosophy now. And that just, like I said, that's why it's hard for me to just be able to sit there and watch, you I know? know. And and I, like I said, you know. a good in Texas. But I watch that team. They, they play the game. You can see Boach rubbing off on on, on this team. Uh, the way they pr approach the game, uh, it's fun to watch. And Dusty the same way last year. Uh, Dave Roberts. 
even our guy uh, uh, Thompson. Thompson, yeah, he was, he'd been in the minor leagues for so long, been with the Yankees. You can see that rubbing off. And hey, come on, man, put it in play. We want to put it in play here. We got a man on third. I don't care if you hit a two operas, put it in play, make something happen. But that stuff's good to see. It really is good to see. Yeah, and, and that's what's that's what's fun with everything. Yeah. That's the best part. That was the best, you know. Growing up, when we had two leagues, I was a National League guy, I was a Phillies fan. Growing up, being able to watch pitchers hit, doing that stuff, just because it was it was fun. You had to. It was a chess match. Now it's yes, and I don't know if any of the pitchers that you played with that could actually hit. Wait, who could? I was trying to think who could hit Rick back Wise. in the, Rick Wise, yes. the guy we traded for Carlton. He had two yep. home runs and threw a no hitter, a perfect game in Cincinnati against the big red machine. <laughs> Carlton can swing it a little bit too. So, but that was fun though, watching pitchers hit. Now they don't, they don't even, which I, you know what? I didn't like that, but now I say, you know what? Pitchers don't care about hitting. Plus they blow out their hammies, running foam to first. They'll break a finger trying to bunt, keep them, keep them in the dugout, let them go out there and pitch. Yeah. Yeah. So hope, so hopefully there, there will be some, some, some change, but you know, like you said, you hope it's more towards, our style of play bring it back a little bit. You don't have to bring it back all the way. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure you get questions from fans and stuff walking around. Right. And say, hey, yeah. And seeing and that. Like, so, I mean, a lot of these fans in Philly, as you well know, they liked the style back then, even like the 08 team, those guys hit and ran, they stole bases. And that wasn't that far, that far removed. They liked that. And I think you're going to see it with our team. You saw it last year, the second half. We do a lot of stealing bases, and, and we got some big boys that if they get hot here, we, we got a chance to be back where we were last year. So it's going to be fun in the second half. Yeah, for sure, with the trade deadline coming up and everything okay. else. So, I mean, but you're – and I, 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 had a, I was on a show earlier. We talked about the dog day. Here, here's the dog days. Here they right? are. It's, it's yep. six weeks of – you can see the light. But and this is what's really going to separate everybody. Yep. So the Phillies are what, sitting in third place right now? Yeah, we're in third place. I think we're a game out of the wild card. I okay. don't think anybody – catch Atlanta. I mean, I'm not saying you can't. They're hitting on all cylinders right now. But it, I think we're going to be a easy, not easy, but we're, we're going to be in the wild card. And as you well know, it's not how good you're playing. It's not who you're playing. It's how good you're playing. And the Phillies last year, they caught fire, man, at the end. If we can do that again, and you got Wheeler and Nola at the top, who knows what can happen. Yeah, and this, depending on what you know, what, what moves they're going to go out and make. I mean, you exactly. could be the best team in, in baseball. I mean, look at the best team in hockey. The Bruins were out in the first round of the playoffs because of oh. because of a wild card team in, in the Florida Panthers. So I mean, it's you know you you, you know with, with everything. Getting... Yeah. Second. So is is uh, is Hall back now? The lefty yeah, yeah, Hall's back. Uh, okay. He got some big time pop. Yes. Like Reese Hoskins. People don't yes. realize. He got to get on base. Good guy, good guy in the clubhouse. Works hard. When he gets hot, man, he's hard to get out. I think they really appreciate what he did because he hasn't played all year. He blew out his knee, so yeah. hopefully this will help him. Uh, I know he's a free agent. If we don't sign him, someone's going to sign him. He's a good kid and he works hard, and uh, he's big bat in the middle of the lineup. Yeah, yeah. I had a chance just when you guys were in town uh, opening day. I just talked with Bryce, right? Oh, yeah, that's right. Cause, yeah, because we were. T I talked to him a little bit about just. You know, what, he's like, I'm not. Is he going to rehab? He goes, No, I'm just going to come back. And uh, is he actually throwing yet? I haven't seen. I haven't seen just DH and still. Yeah, uh, he. You talking about Hall? He's. he's oh, no, Harper, no Harper. Is is Bryce back oh, throwing? The the rumor has it they've been away now. That after the break, he's supposed to play first base. We're going to see. We're going to okay. see. He's been taking a lot of ground balls over there, so we need him out there because then you can get Schwab off his feet and let him DH. Yeah. Schwartz DH and he's dangerous up there, but yeah. he's he's played every game man, in left field. It's tough. Oh, I'm sure it's. I've seen it's, he's struggling a little bit right now with yeah. it, but yeah. you know, I you know, I trust. You know, Chicken Head was my hitting coach in the Arizona Fall League. Good old Kevin Long was my hitting coach, so oh, yeah, to talk with him and stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so seeing that and, and getting those, it looks. It seems like Castellanos is going pretty well right now he too. Is. So it, I like our team. Right now. I really do. Scott uh, Bohm, uh, we'll get we'll get uh, our shortstop going a little bit. Because he's a lot better than a 250 hitter, as we all know. So, yeah, but, uh, and, be fun to watch. It was, you know, I remember in the beginning of the year, it, it, it was a struggle watching some yeah. of those games. Oh gosh, it, it sort of reminds me of this year. We, we we start playing better the last four weeks, but early in the year, man, we were struggling. But now it yeah. seems like we're hitting on all cylinders. So yeah, so you get what about two weeks trade deadline? So there'll be it'll be interesting to see what happens here. There's a you lot know, of guys. Dave's gonna yeah. make money if he can. So yeah. 
absolutely. So, so it'll be interesting to, to see. And uh, like I said, you're getting ready for to start this second half and, yeah, and everything fun. else. So, yeah. Um, but like I said, I, I appreciate you jumping on today, Larry, and having uh, I appreciate it. Thanks conversations for having- and talking about this. And like I said, we'll uh, we'll definitely have to if I get up in the town, come up come up to a game or whatnot. But oh, you're really? living in the area, enjoying it and stuff. Oh, so I'll be um, glad. Great. So, but yeah, man, I, pr- I appreciate. It. Like I said, good luck to your Phillies, and maybe we'll have a Rangers Phillies World Series. That'd be great. That'd this be year. great. So, yeah, absolutely. Right, so, but yeah, I, I appreciate. It. Thanks, Larry. <laughs>